Hi, and welcome to the Antiques Air Show. And welcome to Tyab Airport, the Tyab Air Show 2024. On Sunday the 10th of March, I took the drive down to Tyab Airport, located about one hour south of Melbourne on the Mornington Peninsula for the biannual Tyab Air Show. The little bit of flying training I have done was at Tyab, so it's an airport I'm quite familiar with and I always enjoy making the journey down. The weather on Sunday was hot, a top temperature of somewhere between 34 to 36 degrees and a gusty north northwesterly made for quite challenging conditions for pilots. Luckily, Tyab's main runway is a north-south runway, so there wasn't much of a crosswind, although in the air, pilots reported gusty and bumpy conditions. The lineup at Tyab is always quite diverse and offers something different. There were a few Wingels, a Yak-52, Perceval Proctor, this unique little aircraft known locally as a useless flying object, a CAC Sabre did a flyby, as did a C-130 Hercules. There was a Corsair, Avenger and a Kitty Hawk, plus a few others. So let's explore the flight line and see what history we can uncover. Let's first take a look at and explore this World War II torpedo dive bomber, the TBM Avenger. The Avenger is known by two designations, the TBF and the TBM, and that relates to where it was manufactured. The TBF was the original design produced by Grumman with nearly 2,300 examples produced until they stopped in 1943 to focus on fighters, while the TBM was manufactured by General Motors under license with production beginning in late 1942 with just over 7,500 being produced. General Motors produced the TBM-3 which was a variant produced in the biggest numbers and featured key upgrades such as greater amounts of armour, a 50 caliber mounted on each wing to replace the engine mounted 30 caliber machine gun. Pilots have found this to be inadequate, and a more powerful engine in the form of the 1,900 horsepower Wright 2600 that improved performance. The Avenger entered service during 1942, replacing the Douglas Devastator, and saw its first combat during the Battle of Midway, where five of the six Avengers were shot down during an unescorted raid against the Japanese ships. However, the Avenger was soldier on and see much success during the Second World War, seeing wide service with the US, but also with other air forces, including the British and the Canadians. It would help to protect convoys crossing the Atlantic, being able to float off the shortened decks of escort and light carriers, which is quite amazing considering how big the aircraft is, and was credited with the sinking of 30 subs. Other uses included being adapted to become a night fighter, radar equipped sub hunter, and electronic countermeasures aircraft. The Avenger was also the aircraft which in September 1944, US President George H.W. Bush was flying when he was shot down and forced to bail out. He was awarded the DFC for his actions in delivering his bomb load after being hit. The Avenger had a crew of three, pilot, turret gunner, and radio man slash bombardier slash ventral gunner, and defensive armament included a 50 caliber gun in a rear facing power turret and a single 30 caliber hand fired gun in a ventral position. So that's a very brief history of the Avenger. The example here displayed today is a TBM example and is owned by Paul Bennett Air Shows. Next up to explore, we have this P-40 Warhawk, which unfortunately due to a problem was not able to fly on the day. Sure, the Warhawk is not a rare warbird, but this particular one is, as it is a P-40F. There were over 13,000 P-40s of all variants produced, only 1,300 of which were P-40Fs. The main differences with the F variant was that it was powered by the 1300 horsepower Packard built Merlin V1651 engine instead of the Allison engine that was the standard power plant for the Warhawk. This can be seen if we look at the top of the cowling. You'll notice that the F variant is missing the distinctive bump on top of the engine cowling, or in more scientific terms, is missing the carburetor air scoop. Instead, this was incorporated into the cooling scoop beneath the engine. The prototype P40F, a converted P40D fitted with a 1300 horsepower Rolls-Royce Merlin 28 engine with a single stage two speed supercharger, took to the skies for the first time during June of 1941 with the hope that the Merlin would improve performance. 
Performance didn't improve, however designers were disappointed that gains made weren't significant. Max speed increased to around 370 miles per hour, up from the 362 miles per hour of the E variant. Another significant change to the design occurred during production of the F variant, when the fuselage was lengthened, moving the tailplane back to help increase directional stability, and this was a design change that would be incorporated on all variants moving forward. 150 P-40Fs did end up with the British under the Lend-Lease program and were named Kitty Hawk 2, although few saw service with the RAF, with them either being returned to the United States Army Air Force, handed over to the Free French or sent to Russia. In the US, some P-40Fs were refitted with an Allison engine to be used as training aircraft and redesignated P-40R1. Ultimately though, with a shortage of Merlins and no significant improvement, the P-40F would only be a short sub-story in the P-40's long career. The aircraft we are looking at here today is only one of two P-40Fs flying today, the other of which is based in the UK. It was built in 1942 by Buffalo in New York and was sent out to fight in the Pacific. We can tell it's an early production aircraft of the F variant as it has a shortened fuselage rather than the extended version that was incorporated in later production. 699 P-40Fs had the shortened fuselage, just over half of all produced. This particular aircraft saw service in the Pacific with the 13th Air Force 18th Fighter Group 44th Squadron of the United States Army Air Force, where it was lost during a training flight on the 20th of December 1942. It was one of four aircraft on a training exercise from Afate, Vanuatu, when they hit a severe storm and all four crash landed on the island of Eramango. During the war, two aircraft were salvaged while the other two were stripped for parts and left there. These two aircraft were eventually salvaged in 1989 where they were shipped back to Australia and this one came into the hands of Judy Pay. Restoration began in the 1990s and its first flight was completed in 2009. Since then, it has stayed with Judy Pay and is based at Tayab. There was also a couple of World War II era vehicles on display at Tayab with a handful of reenactors. On display was a Morris Tilly and a white M3 Scout car. With the help of one of the reenactors, I was able to interview and talk to the owners of each vehicle. This was super interesting, and a big thank you to Jacob from Cressy Aerodrome for making this happen. The interviews were very insightful, and as such, I think they deserve their own video. So stay tuned for a separate video focused on these two very interesting machines. The next aircraft we will explore on the flight line here at Tayab is this impressive looking F4U-5N Corsair. The F4U Corsair, perhaps one of the most iconic aircraft of the Second World War. It's a big aircraft, but when in the air it looks surprisingly nimble. When design work began on the Corsair in the late 1930s, the Pratt & Whitney R1830 engine had been picked for the design. However, the US Navy Bureau of Aeronautics wanted a fighter with speed, and hence the change was made to use at the time the experimental Wright XR2800 engine. This decision would also lead to the Corsair design receiving its distinctive inverted gull wing. The only propeller that could effectively convert the 1850 horsepower that came from the engine was a 13 foot and 4 inch Hamilton standard hydromatic 3 blade prop. But with the Corsair being built as a carrier borne aircraft, this poised problems with deck clearance. Either the prop had to be shortened or the undercarriage lengthened. The prop couldn't be shortened and the landing gear needed to be short and strong to take carrier landings. Hence, the idea was founded to give the design inverted gull wings, fixing all the problems. The Corsair prototype flew for the first time on the 29th of May 1940 and became the first American combat aircraft to break the 400 mile per hour mark. It would also be the first Navy aircraft to have a flush undercarriage when retracted. The achievements of the Corsair during the Second World War are well documented and in an effort to not draw this video out too long, I'll skip over them for now as this Corsair in front of us provides an opportunity to discuss the Corsair in the post-war period. 
Following the war, the Corsair would continue to see significant action. It proved valuable in Korea. In 1950, over 80% of all US Navy and Marine close air support missions over the peninsula had been carried out by the Corsair. The French used it over Indochina against the Viet Minh between 1952 and 1954, and then again over Algeria during the Algerian War, with some 15,000 hours being flown over Algeria. Furthermore, the French sent their Corsairs in during the Suez Crisis in 1956, and then again over Tunisia during 1961. The Corsairs' last combat wouldn't be until the Football War of 1969, when both El Salvador and Honduras used a type against each other. This war would also mark the last combat between piston engine aircraft, with Honduras equipped with Corsairs and El Salvador having a mixture of Corsairs and Cavalier Mustangs. Honduran fighter pilot Captain Fernando Soto would claim two Corsairs and a Mustang during the four-day conflict. It also appeared in the Argentine Navy and the Royal New Zealand Air Force. Production of the Corsair came to an end in 1952, with over 12,500 examples being produced. In all, there were seven main types of the Corsair, and in total it went through over 950 major engineering changes. This particular aircraft in front of us here at Tyab was built in 1951 and saw limited service with the US Navy. After service with the US Navy, it was one of about 20 Corsairs that ended up with the Honduras Air Force during the mid-late 1950s. The Corsairs of the Honduras Air Force would see service during the football war, however the combat career of this example here at Tyab is unclear. Eventually, in the late 1970s, the Air Force began selling off their Corsairs, with about 17 examples being sent back to the US following acquisition by a company, Hollywood Wings. From here, this Corsair was picked up by the Walt Disney Company in 1987, who then gifted it to the Royal New Zealand Air Force as a thank you, as the Royal New Zealand Air Force had provided aircraft to be used in the filming of the Disney movie The Rescue, which had been shot around Queenstown. And do you remember the second P-40F airframe that was recovered that I mentioned a little bit earlier in the video? Well, that ended up with a man called Graham Hosking, who in 1996, who traded it with the Royal New Zealand Air Force Museum for this Corsair project, and so began the long journey of restoring it back to flying condition. That P-40F is now on display as a P-40E in New Zealand. Eventually, after a long restoration project undertaken by Darwin-based company Aerotech, in May 2014, the Corsair took to the skies again. It now resides at Tyab, and Graham Hosking still owns the machine, although interestingly, it is for sale. In a nod to its past, the aircraft still wears the markings of the Honduras Air Force with which it would have worn when it was in service with them during the 1960s and 1970s. And so that brings us to an end of this video. Overall, the air show was good fun, with a nice variety of aircraft on display. It did feel a little scaled back from previous years, but that can be understandable considering everything that has occurred in the four years since the last event. The Corsair would have to be a highlight for me this year, seeing that thing fly was very cool. I hope you've enjoyed coming along the flight line with me and uncovering some little histories behind the aircraft on display. Thank you for watching and I hope to see you back here soon.